Research Symposium title titled Building a Research Culture for Replicability and Reproducibility in the Social Sciences. My name is Alexander Bogdanovsky and I'll be your moderator today. Um, and today's present presenters include Fernando Hoses de la Guardia, Nick Fox, Olivia Misk, Anna Trisovich, and Jane Benjamin Chung. Um, just a quick brief overview of the agenda. You'll hear four talks today. And we will have some time for open Q&A at the end for with all of the panelists. However, we, we've asked all the panelists to also reserve a few minutes at the end of their block for quick follow-up questions. Um, so all the four, um, four presentations today will talk about repl reproducibility and replicability, obviously. However, they will be targeting uh, they will be addressing this, this topic from um, several different perspectives, uh, starting off with Fernando, who will be talking about uh, reproductions or post-publication audits of computational reproducibility and how they could be used in the classroom. Uh, we'll then hear from Olivia and from Nick, who will be talking about uh, crowdsourced post-publication replications and reproductions conducted as part of the systematizing Confidence in Open Research and Evidence, or SCORE project. Um, then Anna will talk about um, reproducibility from the perspective of data repositories, and will also share some tips and recommendations on how to make replication materials um, more reproducible, reusable, and extensible. And then finally, we will hear from Jade about internal replication. Uh, this is a tool uh, from the perspective of um, labs which is, and, and is helpful for uh, detecting errors and, and uh, publication bias uh, and, and, and bias uh, prior to be before submitting the work to, to a journal. And just like a quick note on terminology, you will hear replicability and reproducibility used almost interchangeably today. Um, a common um, Definition for reproducibility is the ability to obtain consi a consistent result using the same data and, and methods as the original uh, study, whereas replicability means obtaining consistent results across studies aimed answering the same question um, using different data and or different methods. And as I said, some of the presenters today will, will, will use these terms almost interchangeably. This is, this is there's nothing wrong with this, uh, there's just, demonstrates kind of like the diversity of approaches and, um, and um, of approaches to, re to reproducibility across different disciplines and, and uh, scholarly traditions. And then finally, before we get started, at any point today, um, you can feel free to ask your questions, post them at the, in the Q&A box, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I will relay your questions at the end of each, each block to the presenter. And as I said, um, at the end of each block, we'll allocate a little bit of time for open discussion. So at that point, please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to ask your question live, and I will call on you to unmute and, and speak. And then in the meantime, please upvote questions you would like to see answered, uh, because this helps us uh, stay on top of things and we prioritize things accordingly. So with that, I'm gonna stop, my, uh, stop sharing my screen. And I will introduce my colleague, Fernando Jose de la Guardia, who is a project scientist at the Berkeley Initiative for Transparency in the Social Sciences, or BITS, where he does research on computational reproducibility and also um, pushes the tools and, and practices of open science in the domain of policy analysis through the approach of open policy analysis. So Fernando, thank you for joining and take it away. Thank you, Alex, for the very nice introduction. Uh, I will share my screen now. Um, let me um, let me uh, one second. Uh, I'll put my slides also in the chat. So if people wanna follow through, um, I will. Can you see my me passing the slides? Yep, looks great. Okay, great. Uh, all right. Um, so thank you again for, for, for the opportunity to present in this uh, fantastic conference. As, it's, as, as Alex says, I will be talking about our project uh, about accelerating computational reproducibility 
uh, or Acre uh, using the social science reproduction platform, which is the main output of this project. Um, as, as, Alex, as Alex said, we, we're both at the Berkeley Institute of Transparency for social, for social Sciences, or BITS, where we basically we work towards increasing the credibility of social sciences and its connection with um, public policy. This is the core team behind uh, Acre. This, we have many others contributing, hopefully uh, uh, duly credited in, in that link. And we are part of a large organization called the Center for Effective and Global Action. Um, the main motivation to, to talk about uh, computational reproducibility here today, it's, it's a, the standard motivation. We uh, almost 90% of the talks that I've seen of, around computational reproducibility start with uh, the Clarebo principle. And for, for those of you who have not heard it, this is basically the idea that uh, we should not think about the paper as the main scholarly output. We should think of the paper as the as the advertisement of the of the research, and the, the entire scholarly output should be more the the the, the entire computational environment. So as, instead of putting the the quote once more time, I, I decided to write a to mimify the the the, the Clarebo principle, which is basically the same idea. Uh, typically, the manuscript is just the tip of the iceberg, and and the, the scholarly output should be the entire iceberg. So, and with that with that in mind, uh, we think that there's a big big uh, uh, loss opportunity in 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 the sense that every year around the world we see uh, graduate students of uh, across uh, fields uh, doing empirical or applied work, doing an empirical labor or, or applied social psychology or or some type of course where a typical assignment in that in their class would be to reproduce the results of a, of a paper and, and possibly testing the robustness of those results. Uh, so again, each year, the students around the world will go through the motions of doing something like this. They will look at the iceberg. They will just check out if there's, if there's anything like a, a reproduction package. Is there data? Is there code? And, and answering that is knowledge. They are generating knowledge, whether or not they're this, this uh, reproduction package exists. Then they will generate new knowledge, new knowledge in the sense that they will assess the degree of reproducibility of, of a part of a paper. They might improve it, they might fix some paths, they might update some libraries, they might write some code or other things. Uh, and they, moreover, they might also test results, they test the robustness of results. And particularly, if they, if they confirm that the results are robust to additional specifications, it's rare that this will be written up into a, into a, a self-contained paper. But these, all these pieces are new knowledge that are generated all the time. But unfortunately, at the end of the semester, they are buried in, in some type of presentation or something like that, and, and they're not preserved. And what we're trying to do with the social science reproduction platform is to provide an environment that would allow uh, um, students or producers around the world to, to uh, record this knowledge. So the framework of how we think about this is that we want to move a little bit away from binary judgments of uh, uh, we understand that it's easy for this exercise to gravitate towards adversarial, adversarial exchanges. Um, and we understand also that early career researchers have incentives to emphasize access, uh, unsuccessful reproductions, but also that senior researchers, original authors, uh, have a position of power to deter this, this type of uh, reproductions. And on top of that, the, the media focuses a lot on, on eye-catching headlines like things to reproduce or don't reproduce. Uh, so we don't want to say this. We do not want to say paper X is reproducible or irreproducible. Uh, what we do want to say is something more nuanced along the lines of result Y in paper X has a high or low level of reproducibility based on several uh, attempts. Uh, and moreover, we, we do want to say when somebody improves the reproducibility of, of, a, of a paper. Uh, so we want to keep track of that. And we want to we uh, uh, allow people to, to uh, get credit when they do that. So the way we approach this is that we, we follow the, the, this idea that comes from the SCORE project uh, of basically breaking a paper into claims. Uh, and, and on top of that, we, we suggest that uh, each, each claim is going to be supported by specific display items, tables, or, or uh, figures. And each display item is going to contain several specifications. So we're going to 
ask reproducers to, to identify what are the ones that are the, 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 the key specifications that will support the claim that they're interested in. And in doing this exercise, the main challenge is going to be around standardization, because uh, this exercise is conducted around the world in around across fields. But as, as Alex was saying, these concepts differ. People use different words to refer to similar things. So basically, we together with the platform, we created a set of guides to try to standardize as much as possible this, this exercise. And, and we hope that the, that the proposed uh, framework will be helpful uh, for students across fields. Uh, so with that, uh, I, now I would like to show you the, the result of, of our uh, uh, of uh, basically our proposal of, of how to how to conduct these these reproductions in in a, in a standardized way, and uh, the for that I, I will invite you to go to the social science reproduction platform socialscienceproduction.org, or you can follow with the screenshots that I will be showing you here. But the I'll just be walking you through how a, a example reproduction uh, could take place. So. Uh, this could be uh, the, 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 the reproduction exercise will go in stages. Uh, we'll, we'll start from selecting the paper all the way through checking robustness. Um, and, and I'll just give you a, a brief uh, introduction of, of how these stages work. So on a first stage, the, the, the student or reproducer will be either assigned a paper or will select a paper. Uh, we, we want to distinguish this stage in which the, the, the reproducer will identify if there is any type of reproduction materials that we will call reproduction package in, in order to move forward. At this stage, we recommend that the reproducer should not even read the paper. They should just check, is there any reproduction materials, yes or no? Uh, is there a metadata also on the paper, uh, usually, uh, uh, recorded around the digital object identifier uh, or, or the unique uh, stable URL of, of, of a paper. And with that, they we recommend that they move forward. Uh, so, and they will go to a platform and uh, basically in the first stage, we'll find something like this. They will find a, the option to enter a DOI or digital object identifier. Once they enter that, the, the platform will check on uh, in, uh, in Crossref or a bibli bibliographical service to to check the additional metadata uh, and we'll pre-populate this. And then they will be asked uh, if there is a reproduction package available. Uh, if there is, they can move forward. If there is not, uh, we uh, ask them if they have contacted the authors, uh, if they intend to recreate the reproduction package from scratch. And if, that, um, if, if that's the case, they can move forward through the past, but they can also abandon this paper but leaving a small record uh, in the sense that they have created knowledge, right? So they have learned that a paper might not have a reproduction package and they just added that knowledge uh, in, in a, uh, they, they just recorded this for other people not to have to run into the same issue again. Um, so once they have a, a declared paper, once, once they have identified a, 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 a paper that contains reproduction materials, then they can start reading the paper. And this is the, the part where they will identify the claim, the piece of the paper that they wanna reproduce. So the claim could be in the abstract, could be in the, in the interaction, but it also could be in the results section. It could be described somewhere uh, deep into a paper. And so here the, the student uh, will, will uh, basically identify according to them, what is the, the key part of, of the paper? In this case, this, this section in closing red, uh, and in their own words, uh, sorry, they, then they will identify where, which display item, in this case, table two, contains this, uh, supports this claim. And in this case, table two contains in column two, the, the main specification, and there's an alternative specification in column one. And then they will go to a platform and record in their own words, what is the claim, uh, what I think, score we'll call a claim, claim extraction. Um, and, and in addition to describing the claim in a, in a succinct way, then they will identify what are the estimates and, and what are the display items behind these estimates. Uh, so after selecting the paper, they move to scoping. After scoping, then they move into assessment. 
And the assessment, basically the idea here now is that now you have read the paper and now you're gonna sort of like peek uh, under the, the, start looking under the water, right? So you're gonna start looking at the entire iceberg uh, that, that I was showing you. So here they will, uh, a reproducer will go and look into the, the reproduction materials, in this case, a seed pile that they open and it's a, 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 a lots of folders that contain several files. And if they are lucky, yeah, if they're lucky or, or, the, or, or the reproducer uh, or the original authors left a readme file, that might make that will make their job much easier because it will the readme file usually will tell them what are the key files that they should be looking at. In this case, in this case, there is a readme file that points to that script uh, that basically says this is the one that you need to reproduce table two. But once you start looking into the script, you will notice that there are several files that you need that depend in a uh, not easy to see way. So, but uh, in, in the in the platform, we will ask you to record uh, how the inputs and outputs depend in a, in a regarding a particular script in a uh, in that you're uh, uh, tracking, and then the platform will generate something like this. It will generate a reproduction diagram that will allow you to see how the different pieces interact uh, in order to reproduce a, a given display item. And once you have a, a better idea of how this iceberg looks under the water, uh, you will try to run it. Uh, uh, and, and once you run it, uh, you might run into troubles. It might run uh, all the way from raw data. And depending on the results of that exercise, you will assess the, the computational reproducibility of uh, this specific display item. And in the assessment, we have created this 10 uh, level uh, 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 assessment scale that is subjective that we where we have prioritized certain pieces uh, certain pieces over others we we think that having raw data for example uh, should be the, the 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 what what should allow you to access the highest levels of reproducibility uh, uh, and then uh, basically you will be able to record your assessment for a for a given part of, of the paper not only that, but then you can move and, and record improvements. You can also record robustness checks. You can do um, uh, um, different types of, of uh, additions to, to, to the exercise. And we wanna allow the reproducer to record as much of this as possible. Uh, so in improvements, the idea is that uh, reproducers could uh, create an improvement at the paper level, they can, um, I don't know, improve the readme file, for example. They could uh, uh, improve the reproducibility behind a specific display item. In doing this exercise, also they might have learned that that a, a good improvement X could be done in the future, but they run out of time, but they will leave a record uh, as a paper trail for people who come after them. Uh, and in, in, in robustness, uh, they will also be able to uh, increase the number of feasible um, uh, robustness checks, but they could also uh, increase the number of uh, specific, uh, uh, justify the, the, reasonableness, the reasonableness of a specific uh, test. So this will require a little bit more of in-depth knowledge of what's going on with the paper and justify how good our, our robustness test is. Um, and, and there is a connection between the, the degree of robustness checks that you can conduct and, and the reproducibility in the sense that if you have a low level of reproducibility or level one, you will not be able to assess, conduct any uh, robustness checks. Uh, and as you increase in levels, the, the size of feasible robustness checks will increase until by level 10, it will enclose the entire paper and more uh, uh, tests to, to conduct. And, and this also we see as so like the next uh, frontier after accelerating the computational reproducibility of, of uh, uh, entire fields, then we can move into more systematically test the robustness uh, of entire uh, fields or subfields uh, of literature. So that will basically will uh, define the entire exercise of, of doing a reproduction. And this is something that we, we have seen uh, 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 as something that, uh, as, a, as a common exercise that happens across different um, courses and, and, and uh, disciplines. Uh, and, and now basically the, 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 the reproducer will be done and they will complete the reproduction. And, and this is something I, I wanna 
spend some time because I think it's it's where where I think the uh, the value of this exercise comes to light uh, in the sense that uh, once you complete a refraction, you uh, submit it, uh, you can make it public, completely public, you can make it partially public and, and uh, choose a temporarily anonymous setting uh, and, and, other, and other options. But once you make it completely public, this is a, a, a public object uh, that you can cite, that you can share, that you can uh, exchange to improve upon. Uh, so the, what you will see with a completed reproduction, you will see on the top a brief summary. Basically, I will tell you the name of the reproducer, when it was done, the paper that it refers to, how many claims did it went after, uh, did it do any robustness checks, what's their their their, their own uh, definition of the claim, and things like that, and and links to the original reproduction package and links to the revised reproduction package. But this will be just a summary, and and down here. Uh, you will you will be able to see the entire uh, reproduction exercise in view only mode, but you can share it, uh, and you can share it as a uh, basically with stable links, and and this is where things I think get uh, pretty exciting in the sense that you can share it with original authors for feedback, you can share it with your instructors to grade it, uh, you can share it with other researchers to discuss whether or not your assessments are appropriate or not. If you are a graduate student or an undergraduate, you can put it in your CV, maybe when applying to grad school, for example, to demonstrate that you have dived in depth into a paper or, or have some more in-depth knowledge of certain literatures or, or have gotten your hands dirty with, with uh, data and code behind a, a particular paper. Uh, you can discuss it. We have a forum to discuss it. And, and we, uh, we hope that you will be able to cite it. We, we're working to have a uh, DOI, digital object identifier associated with, with each of these reproductions. So you can be cited uh, on, on all this knowledge that you will be generating. Um, so th th this will be the, the, the result of, a, of this exercise. And uh, if you're interested and you wanna use it in, in some way as part of your class, you can just go to the social science reproduction uh, platform. I put the link in there. And, and use it as part of your class or as part of an independent study. As I said, we have created a extensive gu a guidance behind this uh, in, in an effort to, to standardize uh, as much as possible this exercise and, and guide reproducers and instructors when uh, going through these exercises. And, and also we, we have built a, a discourse a forum that allows for people to uh, discuss and, and, and exchange ideas behind uh, all these exercises. Um, so I think I went a little bit too fast and, and I have two minutes left, but uh, I, maybe we can leave it open for, for more questions. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Fernando. Um, well, we have actually a couple of questions coming in. Um, first from David, who's talking about, who's asking about rewards and incentives to do reproductions, um, specifically for universities and teachers who are, one, who are interested in encouraging their students, or also for the reproducers themselves. Um, yeah, so that's one part of the question. And then uh, the second part of the question is whether journals, grant bodies, and universities should, should, whether they should be, you think they should be offering explicit rewards and prizes for people who are participating. And I believe Anna's question in the chat is also. Um, yeah, it, no, in, in terms of rewards, basically, I think before uh, bef before having this type of a, a standardized a way of reporting this type of uh, exercises, the only reward that you could have was to basically write a paper and try to get it published or try to post it in 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 some uh, service. And the, I forgot to mention that there was the, the, the reproduction, the application wiki that basically attempt to basically host uh, papers around uh, rep reproductions. Um, uh, so those would be the, the, the path that you would have before. Now, we're very excited that, that by, it, if you do a reproduction using the, the platform, uh, this, this, this is, becomes a citable object. This becomes a shareable object uh, that people uh, could refer to uh, when when improving uh, on, on on previous reproductions. Um, 
uh, I think that this this will in, we hope that this will increase the incentives of of uh, doing reproductions and reporting on them um, because it, it basically leads a paper trail. It's a it's a digital trail uh, of, of the work that was done. Okay. The other question. The, the other question is whether journals, grant bodies, and universities should whether they should be offering explicit award rewards and prizes for yeah. uh, reproducers. And yeah. then yeah, yeah. Anna's asking if if uh, we have any kind of like partnerships, collaborations with the journals around this. Yeah. So the one of one of the PIs behind this project is Lars Bill Hoover, who's the American Economic Association data editor. And and basically uh, the idea is that we we uh, we want this framework also to be uh, used by by data editors in in, in different uh, disciplines and different journals, uh, and we 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 see this as a, as a, we see these uh, guides and this platform as a complement to the work that data editors are doing, uh, in the sense that it could be a case that maybe a, a data editor might not have the resources to 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 check the reproducibility of all the papers that are submitted to a journal. But they, for him, for example, they could request um, authors to submit the scoping section of the mm -hmm. of their paper, and then maybe they could crowdsource the 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 exposed after publication, the a verification exercise, and and they they can either pay for that, they can uh, keep prices. Uh, basically, th this infrastructure will facilitate that, that type of exchange. Yeah. Um... Okay, um, let's see. We have a comment in the chat. Um, yeah, R Richard is suggesting that we should um, get reproducers to use ORCID so that they can be recognized on their um, re research portfolios and then also incorporating component DOI so that they're related, that the reproductions are related to the original work which is being reproduced. And I think this is this is something that is in the works yep. currently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if there aren't any questions, I have a question for you. Um, and effectively, what is what is kind of like the minimum skills and knowledge of reproducibility or experience with conducting replications bef before um, that is necessary so that people can do a reproduction on their own? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that's a good question. The the basically the, the, the minimum skills, uh, we we think that this, this type of exercise can be conducted by undergraduates uh, in the sense that you need to you don't need to understand in depth the methodology of a paper. You don't need to understand, you don't have to have any specific coding skills, but what you need to be able to 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 you need to be able to read the abstract or the introduction and the introduction of a paper and identify what's the main finding or claim that is being uh, advance in a in a paper. Uh, if you are able to to identify that, basically that that gives you your your target to to uh, conduct your your reproduction around. And with that, basically, uh, th there should be no requirements. Uh, you could think that there might be software requirements in the sense that to to conduct certain reproductions, you might need to have some software. But the the whole point of this exercise is that. Uh, if somebody cannot run a reproduction because they do not have the specific software, that's important information. Uh, is that it could be that all the scripts are there but are in a proprietary uh, 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 statistical software that that uh, we are not asking people to to purchase that thing. We're we're asking people to say I was not able to reproduce it with uh, the current computer that I have. So that should be the the that that will be information uh, to to record. So in terms of requirements, it's basically somebody who's willing to put in the hours to, to go and basically identify the claim and, and look around under the iceberg, I'll say. Excellent. Um, and I guess we have quite a little bit more time to answer one more question from uh, Sophia, uh, who's asking, how does this work with uh, how does this work with closed access articles? Um, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, excellent question. So the, our, our, our scale, our 10 point scale, it, we, we also present a modified 10 point, 10 point scale for uh, articles that you cannot uh, access the, the reproduction materials. Uh, and basically 
uh, the, the idea is that you, if there's confidential data or you cannot access any any part of the of the uh, reproduction package, what we, what we will ask of the reproducer is to report the instructions that are available to obtain those type of materials. So it could be a case that the data is confidential and they cannot get it, but there should be a record that says something like, in order to obtain this data, you need to contact this person in this ministry. Uh, these are the waiting times. These are the fees. Uh, this is what you. This is the metadata. This is the like the, the file size or number of variables and things like that that you will find once you get the data and things like that. Excellent. Well, thanks for answering all the questions and for staying on time. Um, next up, we have Olivia Misk and Nick Fox. Olivia is a research coordinator and Nick is a project scientist at the Center for Open Science. And today they will be talking about the SCORE project. Nick and Olivia, thanks for joining and um, take it away. Great, thank you so much. Um, can you see these slides coming up okay? Perfect. Awesome, all right, great. Uh, well, thank you so much. I'm super excited uh, to be speaking with you all. Uh, Fernando gave a great first talk and so I'll try to do my best following up. Uh, we came up with a very creative name, Building a Research Culture for Replicability and Reproducibility in the Social Sciences, One View from the SCORE Program. Um, and so I really gravitated towards this idea of, of building a research culture, right? Uh, so like any good psychologist, I'm gonna start this off talking about a French sociologist. Uh, Pierre Bourdieu, a French sociologist, he wrote this book called The Field of Cultural Production. It's actually a book that I keep on my desk. Um, and it's, it's interesting, right? So he was looking at the space of humanity, like the humanities and uh, culture from art and literature. And he talked about this idea of reconstructing the space of possibles and where works of art aren't works of art just by themselves, they become works of art by the collective belief that acknowledges them as a work of art. And that can change over time, which I think is an interesting lens to kind of view replicability and reproducibility kind of where we are now, 10 years after uh, all the precipitating factors of the current crisis, quote unquote. Um, trying to go forward, let's see, okay. So uh, the talk's called One View from the SCORE Program. So what is the SCORE Program? Uh, so it stands for Systematizing Confidence and Open Research and Evidence. Uh, it's a DARPA funded program and it is very big. And part of its uh, goal is to look at how to gauge the credibility of published literature. Uh, like I said, it's very big. Um, there's multiple different parts. Uh, the Center for Open Science takes up part of this side on the left, extracting claims, which came up in Fernando's talk. This is something that we do. Uh, we also facilitate replications and reproductions and uh, those lead to outcomes. And those are used as kind of a ground truth for uh, other groups who are uh, trying to uh, predict credibility of, of papers. Uh, so we're gonna talk from this side, from the replication and reproduction side, really the process of the replications and the reproductions. There was a really great talk last week um, with Fiona Fiedler and, and other speakers uh, about kind of the other side of this project, the forecasting of scientific outcomes. And the video of this is now available as of this morning. So if you weren't there last week, uh, please do check it out. It was very, very good. I watched it uh, earlier today. Something that's really cool about the SCORE program is that it covers a lot of the socio-behavioral sciences. It's not just psychology, it's not just one field, but it's actually many fields. It's sociology, it's political science, it's management, it's uh, econ and finance. And uh, as Alex mentioned earlier, and I think my slides are freezing, sorry about this. Uh, so as Alex mentioned kind of in the introduction to this symposium, uh, these different areas have different experiences of replication and reproduction, and they also use different language, right? So in psychology, typically uh, a replication means uh, new data, new analyst, and uh, an analysis plan uh, similar to uh, what is described in the paper. Uh, whereas in econ and finance, a replication can mean uh, taking the same data and the same analytic code to reproduce the values in a paper. And that's okay, right? There's different, uh, uh, experiences in these fields, 
Uh, Bourdieu might call this a habitus based off this discipline, right? It's kind of uh, the upbringing that you're brought up in a field, uh, kind of cements the decision-making processes kind of in that social structure that you're brought up in. The process of doing these replications and reproductions in the SCORE program is very complex. Even at a very high level, there's many moving parts, there's many pieces. Uh, you know, again, Fernando mentioned uh, something similar uh, that BITS does in identifying original materials from a study, which even kind of gives you this landscape of what kind of projects you can do. Uh, contacting original authors, there's multiple types of ethical reviews, power analyses that need to be considered. Um, pre-registration and uh, revision process, peer review process. There's a lot. Uh, we'll talk about some of these um, here highlighted, and I'm gonna pass off uh, the first two to my uh, colleague, Olivia, to talk about. Great, thanks, Nick. Um, so I'm gonna cover, like Nick just said, the first two um, parts of our process that he highlighted, and then I'll pass it back to him um, to dive into talking more about our collaborators and our pre-reg review process. Um, so a, prelim a prelim preliminary, sorry, step of our reproduction and replication process is assessing whether original um, data, code, and other materials are available. Um, and there's obviously practical reasons for doing this. Um, so reproductions require original data, um, but ideally original data and original analytic code. Um, and original materials aren't necessarily required for replications, but um, the more original materials available, the better. Um, and this also lets us take a look into how researchers share their data and materials, um, both how they've shared publicly online and how they've shared um, when contacted for materials. Uh, next slide. Um, and so we started assessing data and code availability across papers within our sample to get a sense of which papers have data and code available and also how many, um, and to kind of facilitate our reproduction process, which requires original data and code. Um, and this is still an ongoing process, so we still haven't assessed all of the papers within our sample. Um, so to do this, we start, um, started with looking through the original papers themselves and look for um, links to original data and code. And then if we don't find any there, we then conduct a web search um, for data and code, um, looking at various sources. So we do a general Google search um, and then look through common data repositories um, like ICPSR or OSF. Um, and then we also check a few other places like author websites and lab websites um, that sometimes have original data on them. Um, and finally, from there, if we still don't locate original materials, we will reach out to the original authors directly and ask for their data or code. Um, and as we do this, we assign what we call process reproducibility scores. Um, and they're meant to indicate whether data or code are available and also um, kind of gauge how easy it is to access original materials. Um, so for example, whether materials were linked in the paper versus stored publicly online um, versus not publicly available, but an author sent them to us after we contacted them. Um, so this allows us to take a look into how Data availability and sharing rates differ across disciplines um, and different journals and over time. Next slide. Um, and so what we see so far within our sample is that there's differences between different social behavioral disciplines in how frequently they share their data as shown here. Um, and again, keep in mind, this is just showing some preliminary, preliminary trends um, as this is still an ongoing process and we haven't assessed all of the papers in our sample yet. Um, but looking across disciplines within our sample, so far it looks like roughly more than half of the papers in economics and political science um, contain publicly available data um, compared to a much smaller amount within psychology and sociology. Um, so somewhere around like 10 to 13% had original um, data and code available. And then little to no papers with publicly available data from education and marketing or behavior and other fields not shown here. Um, though again, we've only assessed a small number of papers from these fields so far. Um, but we do know um, that some disciplines are ahead of others in terms of data sharing. And some of these differences stem from data sharing requirements set by certain journals um, in different fields. Um, but another important thing to consider when looking at data availability across fields is that um, some disciplines rely on existing data sources more than others and sharing or pointing towards these types of sources may look different than um, sharing newly collected data um, from a lab, for instance. 
And of course, different disciplines also use different types of data sources and some data is much easier to share than others for ethical and legal reasons. Um, so for instance, sensitive HSR data or data protected under copyright or blocked by a paywall um, sometimes can't be shared or can't be, is really hard to share. Um, so of course we have to keep this in mind when looking at data sharing um, within different disciplines. And something else worth highlighting that we're seeing within our sample is trends of data availability increasing over time, uh, which makes sense and is encouraging to see. Um, and it will be interesting to look at and compare how data sharing has shifted over time across different disciplines. Uh, so while this is encouraging, uh, we still have a long way to go, of course. Um, and overall, there's not a lot of data availability availability within our sample, which is part of our motivation for reaching out to original authors to ask for their materials, um, which is going to what I'm going to talk about next. So next slide. Um, so now I'm going to shift into providing an overview of our approach towards communicating with original authors and highlight some of our intentions and goals regarding author outreach. Uh, so during SCORE, we try to involve and seek feedback from original authors at multiple stages of the process. Um, and I just want to highlight some of our main motivations and some of the benefits for doing so. Um, so one reason is to communicate our intentions and plan for the replication and reproduction before the project is underway. Um, so the authors are informed and have an idea of what's to come. Then there's of course practical reasons like receiving original materials necessary to conduct reproductions and good faith replications. Um, another big motivation is to receive crucial feedback on a replication protocols. And we might also be able to get insight into detailed information about the original study that the original paper doesn't specify. Um, and additionally, communicating with original authors might also help build norms around assessing reliability of and supporting prior work. Um, so the more that this work is done and talked about, the more it's normalized and potentially even taken into practice within the research community. And finally, this may also help foster collaborative relationships. Um, so for example, um, right now, we actually have one research lab collaborating with the original authors of their replication and working on um, a publication together. Uh, next slide. I'm trying. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Um, so now I'm going to provide a quick overview of our approach towards communicating with original authors. Um, so as I mentioned, we try to keep authors in the loop throughout the process by reaching out at several key stages of the project with the goal of maintaining author awareness and to facilitate several opportunities to provide feedback at different stages. Um, so our first outreach occurred um, once a claim was selected from a paper um, so that we could receive feedback on the claim selected. And then if their paper was randomly sampled to be replicated or reproduced and sourced to a collaborator, we contacted them again at this point to let them know and ask for original materials. And then we contacted them again once the replication protocol was complete to give them an opportunity to provide feedback on the protocol, um, which Nick will dive more into this process in a little bit. Uh, next slide. And throughout this process, uh, we were presently surprised to find that many authors were co cooperative and helped with the process by providing feedback or sharing materials. Um, and some were also very enthusiastic about the project and were more than happy to be involved. Um, which was really refreshing to see. Um, we were, of course, happy to see responses like these when we received them. Um, and it was very encouraging to see lots of interest and even excitement and support of this work. Um, but unsurprisingly, many emails also went unanswered, which was um, to be expected. Um, so, you know, as academics are quite busy, roughly 50% of our emails were responded to. Um, and obviously, not all of our responses were like these. Um, overall, our responses were pretty mixed. Um, of course, not everyone was excited to potentially have their research replicated. Um, some were skeptical, and a few even told us we wouldn't be able to replicate their findings before knowing how the replication would be carried out or even if their study was selected for replication. Um, but overall, we were encouraged by responses like these and are very grateful to all of our original authors who took the time to send materials and provide feedback and participate in the process. Uh, next slide. Um, and it seems as though enthusiasm for replication is growing and it's becoming more of a norm in practice, or at the very least, it's becoming more of a normal concept for researchers to think about as it gets brought up more and more. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, communicating with original authors is 
not only good practice for improving the quality of for application um, and necessary for practical purposes like receiving original materials, um, but it may also help foster norms around replication within the research community. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Nick to talk more about our collaborators. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much, Olivia. Uh, so if anyone caught it in one of the earlier slides, one of the steps that I had laid out uh, kind of coldly said sourcing replicators and reproducers. And I think, uh, you know, it, it's, it's there, uh, one, uh, because it's uh, fit in the box, but really, uh, what we're doing is building and fostering a community, right? It's hard to do the kind of project that, that the SCORE program aims to do without a lot of community support. And uh, I think every actor that's working in the SCORE program would wholeheartedly agree. And so building and fostering that community, I think, is really important, not just for uh, the outcome of, of the SCORE program, but really to kind of build this research culture uh, that, that more wholly embraces replication and reproduction. Uh, there we go. So uh, mirroring the areas uh, of, of study in the socio-behavioral sciences, uh, our collaborators look similar. We have a lot of psychologists, uh, but we also have sociologists, political scientists, uh, management uh, scientists, uh, people who work in economics, education, and uh, they also have very, different interests in the project, right? So you can have people who want to do a fully fledged replication or reproduction, but maybe they don't have uh, the lab to run participants, or maybe they don't have the time to, to put into it. And so there's many places in a, a culture of replication and reproduction where people can help. Uh, Pre-reg editors and reviewers are uh, very common and people are very interested in working on this. Uh, claim extraction, which is kind of up uphill of what we're talking about here. Uh, people to help understanding what generalizability means in this context. Uh, even people who are interested in doing kind of the clerical work of making sure that materials to be submitted to local IRBs are complete, right? So something that feels like, uh, you know, paperwork and desk work that is maybe not as shiny or fancy as doing a replication or reproduction. There are people there who are interested and who have the time and, and capability to do it, and that helps the process. And so uh, seeing kind of the, the group of peers and collaborators and community members and all the different places where they can kind of pitch in and lend a hand in doing these types of projects uh, is really important to, to being successful and to making that culture change. And people also have very many talents, which is also extremely useful. So. Uh, there are experts in certain types of methodology and domains, obviously, uh, and both statistical expertise and software expertise. So this came up uh, in the chat, I think, during Fernando's talk, is that access to certain statistical softwares might be a barrier to doing certain types of projects. And so having a very large and diverse group allows to kind of find the people who can pitch in and do certain things. So, um, you know, while that sample size is small, if you miss someone who has data, that could be a problem. Uh, but when the group is very big and, and everyone's pitching in, uh, that can help for sure. So this heterogeneity among collaborators, uh, while there is some you know, difference between language use and expertise and what it does, it provides a means to reconstruct that space of possibles. We can actually take everyone and all the pieces that they can contribute and reconstruct kind of the cultural environment that we see ourselves in. And I'll try to give an example uh, so one of the process pieces that we have is that we uh, are replicators and reproducers, they write pre-registrations, but then we peer review these pre-registrations and it's unblinded and it happens all in real time. We utilize Google documents. And so uh, everyone is in that document at once working on it. So what happens is, uh, so it's community driven. Uh, the COS score team really just is the air traffic controller. We just make sure that everyone's kind of staying where they need to be and, and doing what they need to do. The replication or reproduction team writes the pre-registration. We see it, we make sure all the pieces are in place and we source that to an editor. An editor is a community member uh, and they then find the reviewers who are also community members. We invite the original authors like Olivia mentioned and the replication and reproduction team is there too. Feedback's provided simultaneously uh, by the reviewers, the editor, the original authors. 
And uh, a real key piece of this is that there's a seven day turnaround. There's seven calendar days, one week uh, to have this review happen. And uh, so what happens is the, the reviewers, they leave their comments, the replication team, they get a ping. If you've ever worked in a Google document, you know how many emails you can get when there are changes. Uh, I'm on all of these Google documents, so I see lots of changes. Uh, and so those revisions happen in real time. And these conversations can get very long, as you can imagine. Uh, once the reviews close, the editor uh, is in a position to make a final decision whether or not the review team needs to continue addressing uh, comments or, or issues brought up by the reviewers, uh, or whether it's clear to move forward. And the guiding star for that is that it's a good faith, high quality version of the project that's being proposed. Uh, so well, at the end of phase one of the SCORE program, which was uh, November of last year, we, we reached out to our reviewers and we asked about this seven day turnaround. We said, you know, seven days, did that feel like you were being rushed? Did you feel like you were running out of time? And, and overall, we felt like that, that wasn't overly burdensome. We didn't see many people saying always or often. Most people said sometimes, rarely it was a burden, but oftentimes it wasn't which is interesting if my slides progress. Let's see, we might have to go back a few. Right, so I think this is a really interesting uh, kind of unintended consequence, right? So if we look at the, the SciRev project, which is a project that looks at uh, kind of, it reviews scientific review process, they find that the entire review process for an academic paper, all right? So it's a little different from pre-registration, but the review process for a paper takes about 17 weeks on average, and there's differences across discipline. And what we did was, uh, and we've done this hundreds of times now, we've been able to successfully get thorough reviews of protocol and methods, right? Everything in a pre-registration in seven days, and we use a shared goal. We had a structured project timeline. Uh, we dialed in incentives. This also came up in a, in a Q&A earlier. So we do have uh, incentives for reviewers and editors. And what we've been able to do is challenge that academic process structure of this pre uh, this peer review and route to building a culture of replication and reproducibility. And I think that is a really interesting signal of this reconstruction of the space of the possible. Uh, so I'm going to hand it off to Olivia for the key takeaways. Great, thanks. Um, so to summarize, I'm just going to leave you with some key takeaways and um, different lessons learned that we've um, found throughout this process. Um, so of course, large scale collaboration is challenging and costly from a coordination standpoint, uh, but very worthwhile. Um, so as Nick mentioned, it's a very complex project with a lot going on, a lot of different types of projects that we're doing and so many collaborators. Um, so it's very challenging coordination wise, but it's been so beneficial. Um, we wouldn't be able to um, accomplish everything that we're doing without the large uh, number of collaborators that we have and from different uh, perspectives um, and kind of collaborators that contribute to different parts of the process as well um, so that we're able to do so much more. Um, also incorporating external feedback um, can be challenging but is so important for improving quality um, and facilitating understanding across different domains. Um, so you know, as Nick just talked about the pre-registration review. Um, so definitely um, we try to get as much feedback as possible um, from pre-reg review editors and reviewers to um, contacting original authors. Um, and this also, the entire score process allows us to um, learn a lot more about um, how different researchers from different perspectives um, approach things like replication and reproduction or um, things like generalizability and robustness. Um, and it lets us um, think about um, and learn more about how people approach inference and how to interpret different types of evidence and what they think is important. Um, and finally, clear communication and expectations are key for large scale collaborations of this nature, um, which we've definitely seen. And clear communication and more communication surrounding concepts like reproducibility and replicability can help normalize these concepts and build a larger culture around replicability. Um, next slide. And so that is all we have. Um, thank you so much for listening um, wherever you're at or whatever time it is where you're at. Um, and I just wanna also give a quick shout out and thanks to um, other team members um, at COS who work on SCORE. 
Um, we have a really great hardworking team. And of course, this is these are just the individuals that work at COS on SCORE. We have so many collaborators from all over um, and contractors working on this project. So um, thanks so much and happy to answer any questions you might have. Excellent. Thanks so much, Nick and Olivia. Um, we have a question in the Q&A box uh, from an anonymous attendee um, who's asking if you could provide numbers of how many authors you've engaged with to request materials and whether you observe any trends by discipline in terms of willingness to supply um, materials that may otherwise not be posted, posted on a repository. Yeah, I can I can give a little bit of an answer. So we haven't looked at any sort of trends um, of, of who answers or who responds. Um, we've reached out to over 3000 authors um, at least once. And so um, so depending on on randomization and, and how many projects are being done, mm -hmm. uh, some authors are reached out to more than once, but uh, over 3000 have, have been asked. So we have done a lot of author contact. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks. Do we have any other questions? As I said, if there's also an, op uh, an option of uh, raising your hand if you wanna ask your question live beyond this posting in the Q&A box. Okay, um, well, I guess maybe we could save some of the questions for at the end. Um, Hopefully we're gonna have five to 10 minutes to um, for general Q&A with all the panelists. So next up, we will hear from Anna Trisovic, uh, who is a Sloan postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard University, where she studies computational reproducibility, as well as data provenance and data preservation. Anna, thanks for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can you see my slides? Okay, one second. Yeah, we can see um, your slides close the window. How about now? Um, um, yep, yeah. looks great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so yeah, my name is Anna and I'm going to present um, present a recent paper. So this is a paper that I have, uh, the presentation is based on a recent paper with uh, I authored with collaborators. And I'm going to talk about evidence-based steps for the culture for replicability and reproducibility. So again, not very creative title. Uh, as we have seen in the previous presentations, there are a lot of different aspects and perspectives to approach this problem. So uh, kind of like the, uh, the workflow that we are approaching is something like this. So we have researchers who have prepared their um, their paper. They they want to publish something, so they've done a study, and then a journal would come back to them and say, "Oh no!" The journal would come back to them and say, "Perfect, you can publish, but first you need to share your data and code, and here is a data repository uh, with whom we collaborate." And then uh, at the end. Uh, the researchers would share their data and code at the repository and also publish uh, their paper. So this is kind of like the workflow that we are dealing with. And the presentation is going to be organized as follows. So first I'm going to introduce uh, the, a data repository, so the data research data repository. Then I'm going to talk about a large scale study on code quality and execution that uh, I've done uh, with uh, collaborators. I'm going to talk about results and, uh, and discuss them. And uh, in the end, we are going to see what each of these actors, uh, so researchers, repositories, and journals can do to, um, to facilitate this process. All right. So first, to kick off, um, who are we? So what is, who are, what is our perspective? So we are data repository, and I'm based at one. So in particular, Dataverse, uh, data repositories and the Dataverse project, which is a free and open source software platform to archive, share, and cite research data. So the focus is on data sharing and making data available. 
So the project provides data repository software that can be installed uh, at institutions. And in some cases, these um, installations um, support research communities for entire countries. So this is, for example, Norway and uh, the Netherlands. All right, so currently there are 70 institutions around the globe that run Dataverse installations as their official data repository. And here they are. However, um, I'm based at uh, Harvard and um, I'm going to talk mostly about the Harvard Dataverse uh, repository. And this is uh, our landing page. And that is also the largest installation actually because the software itself is being developed uh, here. All right, so how does uh, data sharing looks like? So essentially anyone can share their data with a, with a standalone or institutional account. And here on the right hand side, you can see how this form looks like. So um, at Harvard Dataverse, so, and also in, individuals, institutes, and journals may have their own uh, Dataverse collection, um, which are collections of different data sets. So here uh, you can see uh, two collections of journals. So political analysis collection at uh, Harvard Dataverse and also AJPS uh, collection among also other uh, journals that have their own collections. And uh, they have kind of like their own curated uh, data sets from this, uh, first of the slides that I showed you. So in particular, they would re require authors of, uh, of papers to deposit data and code in these collections uh, within a replication data set. So what is a replication data set? That is a bundle of data, code, uh, and other files needed to reproduce a published study. And here on the right-hand side, we have an example of a replication data set for one of these journals. So we can see that there is uh, some metadata, we can see uh, some data met some data set metrics. In some cases, uh, these replication uh, data sets will, uh, will have badges for if they collaborate with the Center for Open Science. And uh, yeah, there is also a list of uh, actual files, so code, documentation, and so on. Right, so here is a quick summary. So we uh, see, uh, that um, we've seen what Dataverse data repositories have versatile support for data sharing. Uh, we've seen that uh, research data and code are shared in replication data sets that often belong to a journal or institutional uh, collection. All right. So now here at Dataverse, we ask ourselves the following question. How reusable are our replication data sets? Can people can people easily download them? Can they re-execute code files? Can they reuse them? So that's why we've conducted a large scale study on research code quality and re-execution. So now you might think, okay, code quality and re-execution, what does that have to do with reuse? Well, we expect to see that if code quality and re-execution are high, we, uh, then we can assume that reuse is also easier, that the reuse, uh, that the data set will be reusable. However, if uh, code quality and the re-execution rates of code files are low, then we can assume that it is much harder to reuse these files. Right. Um, so this is the study, study that we've done, uh, that I've done with collaborators. So how does this um, workflow, how did this workflow go? So it's important to note that uh, this, uh, kind of like reproducibility or re-execution studies were all automatic, so all automatized. So in the first step, um, our application data set is retrieved from Harvard Dataverse to AWS, so um, on Amazon Cloud. In the second step, we kind of like open up this um, replication data set, collect data on the content, code, install, use libraries, and so on. Then in the next step, we attempt to uh, re-execute the code for an allocated amount of time. So one hour per file and five hours in total. And then finally, we would uh, send this result and other collected data to a backend database for analysis. 
So what are our results, what we found? So first we retrieved uh, 2,109 publicly available replication datasets containing over 9,000 R files. So it is important to note that we've done this uh, automatic re-execution analysis on, uh, in our programming language because it is one of the most popular um, at the Harvard Dataverse and also because it is free to use. Uh, second, uh, over 94% of the data sets belong to social sciences, which I felt was um, important for this uh, session. And also another reason for that is that uh, the Harvard Dataverse repository was initially created for social sciences though now it is more of a general purpose repository. So it's kind of like any, any a scientist from any field can deposit their code. All right, so um, the average data set size in this study, so the median, the median was uh, about uh, three megabytes and uh, each containing uh, a median of eight files and typically less than 15. All right, so when it comes to documentation, documentation and kind of like making sense of these files, we see that the average file, uh, this most of the file name length were 10 to 15 characters, which is quite descriptive. We see that around 60% of the data sets contain some uh, documentation, some standalone documentation, such as a readme file or a code book. And when analyzing the code itself, we see that comments, the comments in the code comprise about 20% uh, of the code, which is also quite positive, meaning that there is a lot of, a lot of additional information in the data set itself. Right, so as I mentioned, uh, there are, so this is a study uh, in R, and there are some conventional conventions in, uh, in the open source uh, R community. And uh, one of the conventions we can see here on the right hand side, so uh, uh, an R package would have uh, a description file, a readme file, license, namespace, a Docker file maybe. So we asked this question, so can we find any of these convention files in, in our uh, examined uh, data set? So in addition to these ones here, uh, there are other ones such as R Markdown, which is kind of like a descriptive uh, R code, then R project and install.r, which is more of a Pythonic approach to install external libraries used in R. So what are our results? We have seen that less than 1% of the studied um, data sets contained uh, many of these files, uh, except for a readme that around 50% uh, of the, or 48% of the data set contains. So that's, uh, that just means that this community, that uh, this community that publishes, that creates research, um, does research and publishes the Dataverse, Dataverse um, currently does not use this conventional help. All right, we could also see that um, uh, most use libraries in research code were the ones used for data visualization, data wrangling, uh, import, export, statistical analysis. But we could also see what are the libraries that were not used. And those are the libraries that are actually helpful for software development, for, for reproducibility. Uh, and, and in particular, we could not see any libraries for co-testing, provenance tracking, environment management, and workflow libraries, which is um, we just also signals that there is a lot of room uh, for improvement um, in social sciences, essentially. Right. Uh, okay, so now what happens when we re-execute the code? What happens, so this is automatic re-execution of, of the code. Um, and we had two phases of uh, this part of the study. So in the first phase, we would re-execute the original code. And then in the second phase, we would conduct some automatic code cleaning, such as installing libraries, um, detecting and installing libraries, maybe fixing some fixed tasks, removing them, and then we would re-execute re the code again. So as you can see, 
uh, some of the some of the files ran out of the box, but we see that library errors were predominant. And uh, in the second phase, um, after the second re-execution, we see a substantial improvement uh, and that many of the errors were reduced. However, library errors were present and also um, file path output errors were also dominant and uh, missing files. So we can kind of conclude that here, many code errors can be avoided by capturing library dependencies and of course, testing code in a clean environment. Um, we also see the journals with stricter data policies have higher rates of re-executable code. So the journal average in total um, of uh, code re-execution was something around uh, 47%, whereas a total average is 45. But then in particular, journals such as political analysis, AJPS, and uh, TSRN have the highest re-execution rates. And these are the ones that have also the strictest policies. And in particular, the policies that require either reviewing data and code or uh, a verification process of so re reproducing the study uh, itself. So, okay, in, in a summary, in a quick summary, we see that um, a few data sets use conventional files, uh, and we see no libraries for unit test provenance or workflows. We see that simple and automatic code cleaning can result in potential improvement in uh, code re execution. And this re execution, so automatic re execution, correlates with journal data sharing policy uh, strictness. All right. So now going back to these the actors, the so researchers, data repositories, and journals, and they would all agree that we want open and reproducible science here, all on the same page. So now let's see, let's see, what can researchers do to kind of uh, uh, facilitate this process? So first, uh, capturing library, uh, libraries used and their versions is critical. So they should, they should do that. So library versions should be captured by minimally using um, built-in R functions such as session info or using a description file in sol.r or by using uh, standalone libraries that, that capture uh, dependencies or then their version. So when referring to data code and other files, use relative file paths, as pool file paths cause errors when the code is re-executed on another system. So this is something that we see in um, substantial improvement when we remove the full path, full file path, we see that the code uh, has other errors, um, but also it sometimes runs correctly. Then uh, workflow capture and management uh, methods such as um, power markdown targets um, will help to automatize uh, your code and specify the correct execution sequence. Uh, also for a more advanced approach, so use Docker to document your runtime environment in a machine readable format and to ensure others can recreate your computing environment. And in particular, there is there are specialized Docker containers for R, they're called Rocker, and I encourage you to check out um, that effort. Uh, so now let's see what repositories, what can repositories do? So let's start from some low hanging fruit. Of course, having and maintaining good documentation on how to adequately deposit research code is really important. So this is how we've done that at uh, Dataverse. Then integration with reproducibility platforms such as CodeOcean, Wholesale, Jupyter Binder, Rank Tool will also facilitate environment capture and the encapsulation of research code. Uh, also, um, having a, facilitating a discussion on this problem. So potentially having an internal Working group will help identify community-wide problems, prioritize them, and implement solutions. And uh, also at Dataverse, we have created such a group, and I encourage you to check it out. Potentially join some of our uh, discussions. Uh, and finally, what can journals do? 
of course, of course, as we've seen in the previous presentations, um, reproducing a study is kind of like a gold standard when when it comes to publications and ensuring that some study is reproducible. So that is also, uh, for example, done so by curators at uh, the Odom Institute, which is kind of a um, third party service for reproducibility and then they deposit the, the data encoded dataverse with these badges that we've seen in the beginning of the presentation. But however, if this is not feasible, then a simple review, if all the files are there, is uh, very helpful. And we've seen here in the study that it does make a difference. It does make a difference in code re-execution. So then um, create reproducibility checklists or templates for authors. So here is an example of one. And then also integrations with their predictability platform is also possible to implement on the journal level. So we here have seen uh, two examples. So the journal eLife has a collaboration with Sancilla and our beloved archive has a collaboration with papers to code, meaning that uh, one can instantly access code for any archive paper. Okay, so finally, we've seen evidence of both good and bad coding and dissemination practices. So we've seen good documentation practices, um, commenting, code commenting, that convention files are rarely used. It is hard to re-execute old code and even harder to reuse it. However, we see that curated replication datasets have higher re-execution rates. It is uh, excellent that we are right now talking about these problems, that uh, there are projects uh, working on this, there are tools being created. So I'm hopeful and I believe that things are looking up when we talk about the culture for reproducibility and, uh, and um, replicability. And of course, employing proposed recommendations would further help uh, researchers, repositories and journals con contribute to research transparency and uh, reproducibility. So again, this, this presentation is based on the findings uh, of the recent paper, and I encourage you to check out for some more uh, specific details on the study. And uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, we have a question from Rose um, in the Q&A box. Was, her first question reads, uh, why did you decide to use R as opposed um, to Python for to, to analyze? for your analysis. Yeah, uh, that is, so, okay. Um, we use R because there, there are just really, really many packages. So there's set packages in R, uh, whereas for Python, they were much, much less. I think there are maybe around 20 data sets that use Python code at the time of you know, the analysis. And even interestingly, I when I created this automatic pipeline, I have mm -hmm. done the same study on Python, and that is published in another paper. So okay. Python also is not a very, uh, it's not excellent, but the R was really good because we could kind of like really have this like large scale um, study and also, um, yeah, kind of like have more statistics on what's happening. Excellent, thank you. Um, then in while you were presenting, a quick question came from Fernando just to clarify. Um, when you you were referring that you had you were successful at rerunning the code, was it simply run or you it was able to re it reproduce the same result? Yeah, yeah. So that is yeah. This is a kind of a re-execution study. So we were just making sure that the code is not um, that the code is not crashing, so that is not failing to. But however, we did uh, look into a smaller sample of these. Uh, uh, of these data sets that were fully re-executable. So if there was a, so out of these ones that data sets where all code files would re-execute uh, correctly, then I kind of had a look in what was happening there. And then uh, in many of the cases, um, actually that, that was uh, kind of reproducing the, the study. So the, it would have the plot or the log files would be the same. So kind of, it's not a perfect signal of something if something is really reproducible, but I think it's a good head start knowing that the code re-executes. That might be a good question. 
Excellent. Sounds good. Um, and we have another question from Rose. Um, if you had any plans to attempt to, uh, to attempt to automate the loading of the libraries as they were when the code was uploaded. Uh, loading of the libraries, what does that mean? Um, uh, yeah, will I? Um, yeah. But, so I think maybe a, a library capture would be a, a good mm -hmm. way to say. So yeah, for example, I mentioned that um, we created uh, this like uh, documentation for uploading research code. We can really see that every year we have more and more um, data sets containing some research code. So then these uh, instructions were created exactly for researchers who have some research code. And when it comes to R, um, the instructions say that uh, maybe the researchers should have some additional file that will capture this runtime environment. And because I'm a Python programmer myself, I wrote that uh, having a file such as install.r that's going to capture these dependencies would be uh, would be best. It's something of an equivalent for as requirements of text. So yeah, in, in, that is in the documentation for people who want to have a look how to upload research code. Thank you. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe Rose, if you if you have any follow-up questions, you could um, follow up with Anna directly. Um, there's a question by anonymous attendee who's asking um, if you have any suggestions for researchers, repositories, and journals, in your view, who is ultimately responsible for making sure that data is are reproducible? This is kind of like a yeah, one minute dollar like, question. <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit of a philosophical question, I think. I think, um, yeah, that's a good question. I, um, I think re researchers themselves should make sure that uh, the code can be computationally uh, reproducible also yeah journal probably yeah it's a good question I, I feel that maybe if someone if if any every of these actors do a little bit have like a little bit closer like make some efforts we will be much we will all together be much closer to the goal of having reproduce, computationally reproducible studies so i think maybe the the the, the responsibility is shared mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like a little bit of effort can go a long way. And yeah, everyone like a, does, does a little bit of effort. So like uh, <laughs> researchers do a little bit more, maybe repositories do a little bit more, and the journals also do a little bit more. And then I think that's um, so that will kind of like yeah, maybe we would much better be have much better chances of reaching the goal. Okay, there is one more. Um, yes, that I could. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So is it debug or the code in the case of an initial failure? Were there constraints on what the person debugging was allowed to fix? Yeah, or was there open invitation to try anything to make the code executable? Yeah, that's a good question. So the thing is that this whole study was completely automatized. Everything happened on the cloud. Everything happened on the Amazon cloud. So everything was automatic and uh, when it comes to this debugging so there was a there yeah there is a this code cleaning algorithm that uh, checks for uh, that kind of like looks for the us libraries and tries to install them uh, that looks for fixed paths uh, tries to remove them so there are some some things that kind of like what we felt was low hanging fruit to uh, some most common errors that we automatically try to fix so yeah, that was then maybe maybe if there was a person who was actually looking at at what was happening, I, I believe all of the files could be executable. But it was kind of a very automatized approach. But again, I think it is a good signal that even with the automatic code cleaning and automatic execution, um, just with some small changes, the things can really uh, improve. Thank you. That's good. Um, uh, well. I think we're we're at time at this point. Maybe we could save this final question uh, for the end, or um, can be written. Um, Anna could type the the answer. Um, but and, yeah, so next up we have um, and yeah, th thanks again, Anna, for for a wonderful presentation and for for answering all the questions. Next up we have 
Jade Benjamin Chung, who is an assistant professor at Stanford University at the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health. Um, her primary research is on interventions uh, to eradicate environmentally transmitted infectious diseases. And today she will be talking about internal replication um, based on her own experience at, at the lab. Thanks very much, Alex. Let me get my slides up here. All right, can you see them? Yep, looks great. All right, great. Um, so as Alex mentioned, I'm gonna be speaking about internal replication of computational workflows in scientific research. I'm an epidemiologist, so my um, case study today is, is coming from that field, but I hope I can persuade you that um, the methods that I'm gonna be presenting are um, really relevant to a wide range of um, disciplines with computational workflows. And... So here's the outline for uh, my talk. I'll start by defining what I mean by internal replication and um, same disclaimer that Alex gave earlier. I'm using the term replication a little bit differently from some other presentations. And really what I mean here is, can you get the exact same answer using the same data um, and potentially the same code? Um, so I'll start with some definitions and, and then I'll talk about how internal replication can reduce bias. I'll present a case study of randomized trials on water and sanitation interventions um, to, to improve health. And then I'll um, close with some alternatives and um, implications. Here's a schematic of how we typically do things in science. We define our hypothesis, collect some data, analyze it, and then we publish our results. And much of what this conference has been focused on is additional tools to help um, improve the reproducibility of the published um, evidence base, published literature. So we can register protocols and pre-analysis plans to reduce publication bias and confirmation bias. Um, we can um, create a reproducible workflow such that a single analyst can rerun the code and get the exact same answer every time. That doesn't mean that um, we've necessarily reduced errors or bias, though, and, and so I'm going to be talking about some ways to do that. We can publish our code and data to increase transparency and support replications by other teams. And um, we can do what I'm referring to as external replication, um, just to contrast it with the internal replication process I'm presenting. And this is where a team of, of scientists who were not initially involved in a study um, use the data and sometimes the code um, to try to reproduce or replicate um, the answer after publication has occurred. And then my focus today is on internal replication, which is a process that we can um, go through prior to publishing our study results. And really the goal here is to catch errors um, upstream before we publish, to reduce confirmation bias and other forms of bias that occur in the analytic process, and to um, hopefully you know, result in a, a more accurate um, published literature base that leads to a more efficient scientific process. So here's a schematic and I'll just cover this at a really high level and then I'll go into a more detailed example a bit later. Um, so um, there's collaborative steps and independent steps in internal replication. And first, you know, ideally you're working off of a, a pre-analysis plan. Um, and once you've collected your data, occasionally you do, you know, need to make changes to your pre-analysis plan. Um, and so, the, you know, the, the two analysts can get together and um, discuss the analysis plan, make changes to it and document them. Um, and then they move forward and begin creating their analysis data sets, working completely independently. So ideally, in, in advance, you know, they've agreed on some naming conventions, you know, file structure, et cetera. But besides that, they're not looking at each other's code, and they're not really having any detailed conversations about their process. They could use completely different processes and even different software if they desire. And then they come together and they compare their data sets and um, assess whether they are functionally the same, meaning, you know, do they have the same columns essentially with the same values that would allow them to perform the same type of analysis at the next step. And um, this is a process that is iterative. Usually they come together and find that there are some differences, discuss what could have led to those differences, resolve them and repeat until they have functionally identical data. Then they move forward and independently conduct um, usually the most simple analysis. So in our case, it's unadjusted analyses. These could be descriptive analyses. Um, perform those fully independently. Don't look at each other's code. Come together and see if you have the same answer. 
And in our experience, it really helped to pre-define a, a threshold. Um, so you could say, for example, that you wanted every estimate, every point estimate, standard error, confidence interval, p-value, if you took the difference of the two replicators of their estimates, it would be smaller than 0 0.001, for example. And, and we chose that number, not because it's particularly meaningful, but just because in a publication, um, you know, if it's smaller than that, it's not gonna make a difference in, in the sort of um, you know, manuscript itself. And so you basically repeat this process until all of your results are within that threshold when you take the difference. Um, and then you can move on to your more um, complicated analyses, you know, adjusted analyses, et cetera. And on this slide, I actually have it um, showing that we could collaboratively create tables and figures, but there's no reason why you couldn't also internally replicate those independently. And in our experience, um, I put these two clocks here to indicate that the data cleaning step was very um, time consuming to replicate because it involved the most um, subjective decisions that really needed to be scrutinized and sort of adjudicated between the two replicators. And the adjusted analyses and more complicated analyses um, you know, especially if they involve any kind of stochastic estimation can also be time consuming to replicate. So now I'll talk about how this process can reduce bias and I'll go over these sort of four main categories of biases and, and errors. And um, I, I wanted to say earlier, and I'll mention it now that really where we're coming from with this approach is, is the idea that these sorts of biases and errors are human nature. So rather than try to pretend that they're not happening, we should just embrace that, embrace, embrace the fact that these are, are bound to occur in any study. We've all made mistakes. And so we really need a, a system in place to, to help us reduce these sorts of biases and errors in our standardized streamlined fashion. So the first one is, you know, we may have a pre-analysis plan, ideally, um, but it can't possibly cover every single analysis decision that we have to make, right? So um, we may end up making what, what seem like relatively small decisions over the course of our analysis, but they have a, a tendency perhaps to confirm our, our biases, right? And so this could be, you know, ideally you would pre-specify some, some kind of algorithm for selecting the variables that go into your um, adjusted statistical models, but perhaps there are some exceptions to the rule and you have to make some decisions around that. Um, maybe there's some outliers, maybe there's some missing data. You can't completely pre-specify how you're going to handle that in most cases. You need to kind of see the data that you're working with. And so again, these are decisions that need to be made. The internal replication process essentially kind of brings everything to light. It brings all these small decisions to light because it's nearly impossible to get the same answer if you aren't making these same decisions. And so what we found was that by doing this, we basically created a log, and I'll, I'll show it to you, of all these things that we had to decide on that came after the pre-analysis plan and even after our update to the pre-analysis plan. The next one is um, even smaller judgment calls, right? So this isn't necessarily about the analysis, but this is what if our, our, we have multiple data sets we're merging and we can't get the ideas to perfectly match? Or what if we thought we could analyze a variable um, on a continuous scale, but actually for whatever reason we need to do it um, as a categorical variable and we have not pre-specified how we're gonna discretize it. So there's lots of smaller decisions that are gonna come up. And again, going through this replication process will require that they be um, discussed openly and decided upon transparently. And then I'll just add that um, we use a process called blinding or masking. Um, so in the in the clinical trials world, you know, we often think about this like offering a placebo, right, to our control group so that our participants are masked. They don't know which group they're in. And also we we often learn that it's a good idea for your outcome assessor, the person who's measuring your, your disease status, to not know if somebody was, you know, getting the drug or getting the placebo. But we can take this farther. So our analysts can also be blinded or masked to the treatment assignment of the participants in the data set. And we can simply do this by scrambling the variable that contains the information on the treatment assignment. So we can just randomly shuffle that. Um, and there's lots of different ways to do that that kind of accommodate stratified designs and match designs um, and, and still allow you to perform your analysis as planned. Um, and, and even if it's not a trial, you can still do this with whatever kind of experimental condition variable that you have. It's really just a matter of scrambling that and then performing your whole analysis, all of your internal replication steps on that masked variable. You internally replicate everything. And then once you're done with that um, and you 
most likely have a lot of null estimates, right? And some chance, um, you know, by estimates that appear to be not null by chance. Then you rerun all your code with the original treatment assignment variable and you get your answer. And this can really help to reduce confirmation bias because you simply don't know, you know, what, what answer you're getting while, while you're in the process of coding. Number three, this one's really simple. We make mistakes, typing errors, it's just a fact. And a typical paper could have hundreds, if not thousands of lines of, of code. And it's really hard to, to prevent this. You know, even pair programming where someone's sitting next to you and, and reading your code, it's, it's just difficult. It's difficult for our brains to kind of wrap our heads around all, all the, the level of detail that goes into a typical paper. So this is really, I would argue, one of the main reasons to do internal replication is that it's the best way, I would argue, to catch these types of errors and fix them before they get into the scientific record, before they influence policy and decisions. And then finally, um, you know, using different analytic software can sometimes give you different answers because different software may have different defaults. You know, we, in our experience, we were using Stata for some things and R for other things and minor things around how they handled, you know, missing values and rounding um, did lead to some discrepancies. And so um, I would argue that it's kind of a good thing to uncover this because you may or may not agree with, you know, how the default was set and, and maybe you need to be a little more careful around that. And this is a, a process that you can use um, to, to check that. So now I'll talk about our case study. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about two randomized controlled trials. They were called the WASH benefits trials. They're sister trials conducted in um, rural Bangladesh and rural Kenya. And they were looking at water, sanitation, hand washing, and nutrition interventions. Um, delivered separately and in combination. And so that's what in this figure, each of the rows is um, indicating uh, an intervention arm. And, and it was a cluster randomized trial with large numbers of clusters and, and young children enrolled um, in utero and followed for the first two years of life. Um, and we tested, you know, three different hypotheses, again, two countries and many, many different outcomes. Um, and this was funded by the Gates Foundation. And in, in our discipline, at least, you know, these these trials results were eagerly anticipated and were, you know we really um, I was I was on the analytic team involved in the trials and we really wanted to make sure that our analysis process was as error free and free of bias as possible and so that's what really motivated um, us coming up with this um, framework and um, I'll give you sort of a schematic of how we went about this um, so we started off with one country primary outcomes. Um, you know, just the core sets of hypotheses. And um, we did this in Bangladesh and we did this to establish our workflow. So we did a complete internal replication to independent analysts. We developed our optimal structure for our analytic, analytic data sets and we replicated everything. And that took quite a bit of time. I would say, you know, more uh, around um, double person time it, it would have taken if we had not replicated. And then after we completed that, we used our replicated code to create a software package in R that the subsequent analyses could rely upon so that we didn't have to replicate again every single step, every single time, you know, for the analytic pieces that were repeated, we could use our internal software. We then tested that on the Kenya primary outcome analysis and debugged the, the program that way. And then for the remaining analyses, you know, all the secondary tertiary outcome analyses, we use that package. And of course, we still had to, to um, you know, internally replicate the data analysis data set generation and some of the steps, but the kind of core, um, you know, hypothesis testing steps could be reliant upon what we initially did for Bangladesh primary outcomes. So there was a really large upfront investment, but then really large efficiencies gained with additional analyses that follow the same overall statistical analysis plan. So um, we registered uh, the trials on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, for anyone who's familiar with that, it's a great site, but it doesn't have a ton of detail. And so um, we also published a peer-reviewed article with the study protocol um, with the rationale for the study, um, much more detail about the study design as well as the statistical analysis plan. But of course, 
that didn't have you know, the full level of detail that we needed for the pre-analysis plan. So once the data was collected and we knew about some relatively small changes that had occurred in the field, we um, worked on an update to that analysis plan, um, which we published and registered on Open Science Framework. And this served, um, this in combination with the you know, published protocol and the registration were kind of the backbone that we used in our um, internal replication. And so here's a peek under the hood. Um, this was one of our many Google Docs, and, and this shows you how we logged the many, many decisions, small and larger, that we made that went beyond what was in the pre-analysis plan. And you know, we um, had the field staff weigh in. Um, in some cases, we had the country PI weigh in. Um, and these types of decisions included things like how to char character categorize things in the other specified field what to do if a child's birth dates were discrepant across different data sets what about mismatched ids all these kinds of things actually can really matter you know you would hope that they wouldn't really drive a different estimate at the, at the final stage but you never know sometimes they actually can and so we have all of these things in, you know, sort of logged in a conversational um, way in our google doc and then we use GitHub for version control. And these are, again, peeking under the hood at some several years old commits at this point, but it shows you how there's numerous examples of errors that we caught in this process that we were able to resolve again before publication. And so it includes things like, you know, we had the wrong um, subset of the study in a covariate screening that we did. We had different definitions of a categorical variable. We saved results to the wrong object, et cetera. So these were all things that we caught and fixed. Um, we created an R Shiny application um, that allowed us to really efficiently um, compare all of our results. And um, here's just a screenshot of the software package that we made. And um, I have the, the reference to the paper at the bottom here. I'm not going to go into all this detail, but if you're interested, we came up with lots of tips on programming to help um, increase the efficiency of the internal replication process. So you can refer to the paper if you're interested. And all these resources are on our OSF page. So I'll just close with a few thoughts on um, alternatives and implications. So the, the choice of whether to replicate or not, um, to me, comes down to several things. There's obviously pros and cons. I've made the case that um, the pros are that we can minimize errors and bias, but that doesn't mean there won't be any, right? Especially if you're doing this with a team member who perhaps is in your same lab with your same training, you know, you code in a similar way, we're all subject to groupthink at times. And so again, it's, it's not going to guarantee it, but it, it will, I would argue, reduce both. Um, funders are increasingly interested in concrete steps that we as researchers can take, and this is something that I've been including in um, you know, my funding proposals as something to do to increase reproducibility of my work. Um, and another pro is just that it's a great bonding experience. You really get to know the person that you're working with because it's a pretty intense process. But as I mentioned, the con is that it does increase person time, and so you do need dedicated resources for this. Considerations on whether to do it. Is this a study that's exploratory or do we think that policy could be based on the findings? In the latter case, I would argue that um, we should consider doing this. Do we need to replicate everything or just a, a piece of the analysis that we are more concerned is error prone? Could I replicate part of it myself, right? So in some pro smaller projects, you know, I, I simply don't have resources to do this, but uh, to by hiring another person, but maybe I can use two different software packages and see if I get the same answer. So there's shades of gray here. I've sort of shown you a, a more complicated version, but there are variations on this. And then just to quickly compare this to pair programming, which is where someone's coding and then a second analyst sort of sits with them and reads and comments on their code as it's written. You know, the, the challenge with that is while well, it may help to reduce some errors, you know, there could be shared biases and also reinforcement of certain kinds of judgment calls that occur when people are working together instead of independently. Um, and then also there's um, this movement to uh, towards pre-publication code review. So um, American Journal of Political Science and some nature journals are now doing this where peer reviewers will actually replicate a study finding, you know, before um, it's published. I think this is a great thing. Um, and I would argue this is complementary to internal replication, but of course it's, it's ideal, I think, from the author's standpoint to avoid having your peer reviewer catch errors at that stage, which is another reason to consider using this. And then finally, as I said, you know, um, National Institute of Health and potentially other funders are really encouraging scientists to think about 
what they can do substantively to improve reproducibility of their research. And so I would encourage you to consider this as a tool in your funding applications. And with that, I'll thank my collaborators and funders and take any questions. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jade. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A box. Um, Fernando had a clarifying question about how you consolidate the differences in each step of the process. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah, I can share um, this slide. I moved quickly because I was conscious of time, but since we have a minute, um, let me show you. So we made this shiny app. Um, so basically we, we created a, a naming convention for, for all of our results objects. And so this is showing you, you know, risk difference, confidence interval, T-statistic and P-value. And what we could do basically is filter on, you know, which outcome were we looking at, which measure were we looking at, which analysis, what was the hypothesis? All these were features of, you know, the paper, these things end up being consolidated into figures and tables. But at the end of the day, we need to see every single number. And so this shiny app allowed us to take the difference between, you know, in this case, I was one analyst and then another person named Andrew, we took the difference between these and would make sure that it's zero. And, um, you know, in the previous tab, we could filter on whether or not it was replicated. So this is showing complete replication, but this was really helpful. Um, before we created this, it was really difficult to keep track of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of numbers that you're trying to match. And so I think that the code for this app um, is up on our OSF page for anyone who's interested. Excellent. Um, so don't see any questions in the chat right now. I have a question yeah, of yeah. my own. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. So I'm also trying to formulate the question. So I um, it's funny. Uh, so I'm yeah maybe I can just ask like this. So I'm yeah, trying to ask you how much longer does it take to um, uh, to complete the study with internal review in comparison to with without it? So. Um, Kind of like what is this like price in, in, in time and effort so it's a great question yeah so i i said it approximately doubled person time right <laughs> uh so the calendar time could be similar um if not a little bit more right because you're not just coding alone you have to have all these conversations um you know while you're while you're coding in between each step um, but I think it really depends on on the particular analysis, you know, and how complicated it is, and if the data that you're getting is really, really clean, and if it's really complete or not. You know, if it's not, then I think that it it could really increase um, the amount of time that it takes to complete your analysis. Thanks, Jade. Um, we have a question from an anonymous attendee is asking: Is there opportunity for crowdsource kind of approach for this kind of internal replication, like some sort of a hub where analysts can make themselves available to be a replicator for someone else seeking one. And That's a very interesting that. idea that I haven't thought of before. Um, and I guess, you know, there's no reason why we, we couldn't do that. Um, I guess normally the, the sort of advantage of doing internal replication as opposed to external um, is that usually your team members are more familiar with the study. And so there's efficiencies there because they, they usually know exactly that how the data was generated and you know, they're really familiar with the study team. Um, but again, yeah, I don't see why you couldn't do that if, if uh, especially if you didn't have anyone available on the team to help. Okay, excellent. Um, and I guess one additional question uh, that I had is, what are your recommendations for uh, sort of open science entrepreneurs who are trying to get their collaborators on board with internal replication? Where should they start and what kind of, what, kind of, what are the resources to first consult the, before, um, before getting started? Yeah, I mean, I'd point them to our paper. We, we lay out lots of tips and advice on, on how to go about it. Um, but I think a good starting point is using it with students and trainees, right? So um, if you have someone who's new to your lab and, and you want to get them up to speed on kind of how you typically do things um, analytically, this is a great experience for them um, to, to learn the ways of your lab and, and to kind of get their, their hands dirty, so to speak, with a project. Um, and, and get a lot of sort of one-on-one -on -one and time together with, with the other analysts. So I, I would say that would be a good place to start. Okay, excellent. 
So um, I guess we've, we've arrived to the part of our panel uh, where, for, where we're gonna open up the floor for uh, general discussion. So if you guys have any questions about like the, the panelists at large, uh, please feel free to either post them in the chat or um, yeah, just maybe raise your hand and we can unmute you uh, to take the floor. Or also, if the, if the panelists themselves want to reflect or ask questions for their peers here, uh, this is a good time. Yeah, I, I would like uh, to ask you guys what you think about who should take the responsibility. That's like the philosophical question that I got. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, um, on that one, like who is ultimately responsible um, for, for ensuring reproducibility and uh, yeah robustness and also maybe uh yeah whether the the kind of like science itself is um you know true phenomena or not yeah excellent thanks for bringing this up this this i think came up during your presentation so maybe let's um let's try to answer going the, around the same way uh, the same order as we did uh with the presentations fernando do you want to Take a stab. Who's who's uh, whose responsibility is it to make their, to, to make research reproducible, reputable? Yeah, that, that's a very very uh, good question. Uh, I, I I think it's basically it's a um, I think probably Nick has a, a a better like systems approach to this, but I, <laughs> I think something along the lines of uh, all the different agents uh, in this in this. Uh, System, I'll say uh, students, uh, original authors, journal editors, funders, uh, and and yeah. So I do think that like standardizing a little bit the, the, the exercise of doing a reproduction could help with that. But but yeah, doing large scale initiatives like what the OSF the, the COS is doing and uh, providing infrastructure that data repositories what. Anna, it's involved, so oh, it's a systems uh, yeah. issue. I actually Make had a student ask. I actually had this student yesterday ask this question, and uh, so I've, I had twenty four hours to think about it. Um, <laughs> what I what I told them was that I think it comes down to the journals, and maybe not the journals like the specific uh, company or, or whatever, but I think it, it falls into the peer review category. I, I honestly think there's uh, an evolution that needs to happen in the peer review uh, process. Uh, you know, now that more code is being made available, the amount of times that peer reviewers even look at the code, I think is, is questionably low. Um, so thinking about what is the role of peer review in a world where now data sharing, code sharing is becoming more of a attainable goal? How does that fit in? And how do journals keep their peer reviewers uh, you know, up to that task? Because I think asking them to do more work for free is also a bad idea. So thinking about that whole relationship is something that I, I think is where it needs to go. But this also means that authors should be sharing data and code. And, uh, and I don't know if we're there yet, uh, so, again, I'm rambling because I don't have a good answer, but I think that that's where I would like to see it in the peer review kind of arena. Thanks, Nick. Um, Olivia or Jade, would you like to uh, elaborate or uh, chime in as well? I have some thoughts. I mean, I think from a practical standpoint, you know, the burden is on the authors, right, mm -hmm. to create great metadata and, and reproducible data, et cetera, and to nicely package everything so others can actually understand what they did. But in order to make that really a fair ask, um, we need to change incentives really at all levels. We need to change, you know, like Nick is saying, how peer review is done. We need to change criteria for promotion. We need to change criteria for funding. It, it really needs to happen across the board. Um, currently, at least from my vantage, I see sort of a mix with a lot of early career researchers um, adopting these practices, but not all. Um, and it takes more time, 
right? Mm -hmm. And if these sorts of, um, and actually it opens people up to some vulnerability that their, their code and their work could be scrutinized when, you know, sometimes other people are just getting away with, with really high impact publications that aren't ever scrutinized. And so I think to make an even playing field and to make it um, the norm, um, it, it really is gonna take a change at every single level and especially um, a change in incentives. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, we have a question from Sam Teplitsky in the chat, um, who's asking for all the panelists, your work is dependent some more than others on different product software infrastructure, not all of which is open. How do you think about supporting open tools in particular so that they're sustainable and reproducible long term? Who would like to uh, try to answer this? Jade? I, I can say something first, but I won't fully answer it. I mean, we try to use all open source software in my lab um, for a variety of reasons, part, partly um, getting at this point. Um, in our case, actually, in, in health research data, uh, being able to publish data is, it's not always possible because of human subjects protections. Um, there is some work being done to look into whether you can create synthetic data sets that are um, basically going to give you the same answer, but that protect patient privacy. Um, again, by scrambling variables and that kind of thing. I think that's sort of a novel idea. I, I'm not sure where it will go. Um, but you know, there, there's increasingly more and more um, open software and, and tools, at least in my field. So to me, um, the, the data share, being able to share protected data feels like potentially a bigger challenge. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts from the other panelists? Yeah, I can also offer just maybe, yeah, it's a, it's, I think it's a really hard question, especially when kind of like thinking for a like long-term, what is long-term? I mean, we have some communities such as Python community and our communities, they're very active, right? Uh, there, you can see that there are many, the communities are big, there are many, there are many, um, many people using these tools, many activities going on. But then, so I maybe would just say that if we are encouraging some tools and some, um, and if we are choosing a tool or a programming language, I would just say maybe choose the one that has a lot of contributors that has that has a big community. So maybe that's the only thing that I'm going to say. It's just, uh, I think that uh, institutes or research groups or researchers can use kind of, um, some some, uh, some open source free tool that has also a bigger community because then that means that bugs are going to be fixed. Maybe it's going to have like a longer um, lifetime than others. So I, yeah, that's kind of like my my thought about it. Thanks, Anna. Um, Fernando or Olivia, would you like to chime in on this? Okay, um, well, maybe for one last question to, to kind of like wrap things up since we're coming up at time. Um, what, 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 are, what, are, what is your vision for your projects? So the, everything that we, we heard today is, is very exciting and, and very promising. Hopefully um, it contributes to getting to this ideal of creating culture for reproducibility and replicability, but where would you like to see your projects um, in the long run? So say like beyond two to three years from now, um, how would you like to see, see what, what you guys have created applied in the, in the real world? Um, and then maybe we start in the reverse order this time around. Jade? Yeah, sure. I mean, I would love for others to adopt internal replication. Obviously it's resource <laughs> intensive, but that's the easy answer, right? Um, I am encouraging you know, my students and my mentees um, to, to do it. I talk about it when I teach epidemiologists. I, I talk a lot about reproducibility you know, as much as I can in, in order to kind of instill the culture from day one of you know, a class I'm teaching. Um, and so that's sort of my, my vision is, is to have this you know, not, not feel like a crisis 
you know, five, 10 years from now, it's just what we do. It's good science. It's best practice. Thanks. Anna, 30 seconds or less. 30 seconds. Okay. So I maybe this workflow, this automatic workflow for code re-execution and uh, for uh, code planning, it can be maybe employed in uh, as part of the, of the reproducibility process. Um, so maybe instead of um, just kind of like people starting from scratch and trying to re-execute from scratch, maybe first we can do an automatic approach, automatic code planning, and then uh, give it to the students to maybe re-execute um, uh, the code and see like what, what has happened in this automatic execution and how that can be improved. A little bit longer than 30 seconds, but that's my... Thank you. Uh, Nick or Olivia? Um, I'll just chime in quick and say, um, basically, um, there's a lot going on in SCORE, so there's a lot I could say about this, but um, mm -hmm. I, hope, I would love to be able to see um, actually some use with um, some of what we eventually um, turn out results-wise um, and people be able to dive in and, and use um, some of the trends we find into seeing what um, to assess other papers of what might be reproducible or replicable um, and the tools that the other teams are working on, um, AI tools as well as like crowdsourcing tools, just basically using this to be able to easier, more easily assess um, credibility and especially like communicating this out to the lay public. Excellent, thank you. Fernando. I just unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, five years from now, I would uh, love for hundreds of students around the world, if not thousands, <laughs> be, be using the, the reproduction platform. Uh, and not only that, but improving the, the, the reproducibility up to a point that it's it becomes more and more the norm that that we see very high levels of reproducibility and we can move to sort of like the next frontier of, of systematically assessing robustness entire of, of, of the of entire bodies of literature and i really like that excellent well uh thank big thank you to all of the panelists for for uh joining us today and for presenting your work um also Big thank you to the attendees for um, raving along. And I realize that it's pretty late, especially if you're tuning in from the East Coast of Europe right now. Um, and then finally, thanks to the organizers for um, honoring us and, and including this session in the agenda. Thank you all. Thank you.